Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave. I hope you are sitting down because in this video I'll be tackling one of the most profound thoughts ever put forward by any philosopher. This is Parmenides and the philosophy of being. Parmenides lived somewhere between 515 and 445 BC, that is after the Milesians, and together with Xenophonus he bridges the gap between Pythagoras and Socrates. As is often the case, scholars speculate if he was a student of Xenophonus or some other philosophers, but there is no direct evidence to support that. Plato tells us a story that when Parmenides was old, he visited Athens and had an encounter with Socrates. We cannot be sure that this actually happened, but it does seem to fit with the timeline. He did not live in Athens, however, but in the city of Elea, on the Italian peninsula, but still within the greater Greek realm, where he studied and then taught philosophy. Now, I call Parmenides one of the four major pre-Socratic philosophers, along with Thales and Pythagoras, because his theories are among the most profound and impactful in Western philosophy. And he also represents one of the two sides in what I have previously called the greatest debate of all time. Because if you remember the end of the video I did about Pythagoras, I mentioned that there are now two distinct ways of doing philosophy. One is a deductive reasoning, where you engage in pure logic, and the other one was an observation followed by inductive reasoning, or trying to make sense of your observations, and that philosophers can analyze both the nature of reality and the form of reality. The Milesians had so far mainly studied the nature of reality, and they used observation followed by inductive reasoning to form theories. While Pythagoras had tried to study the form of reality using mainly deductive reasoning or strict logic. According to Parmenides, both approaches were wrong. He had to get back to studying the nature of reality, and not its form, but then he used a very strict logic. And as he was doing that, something started to bother him. Several things in fact. For example, if there was indeed an arche, whether it's water or the apiron or air, that would ultimately mean that there were little particles of arche, right? As in, if you were to break it down to its smallest components, you would get little bits of pure arche. And Anaximenes said that you get different materials depending on how far apart these particles are. The closer together those particles, the harder, the colder and the more rock-like the substance was. And if it was further apart, the hotter and more fire-like it was. But here is a question. What is in between those particles? If you say, well, there is something between them, then that would mean that there is another substance, a second arche. But that was undercutting the whole idea that there was an arche, namely a one single substance and not two substances. And if you said nothing, then what was stopping those particles from sticking to each other? Incidentally, this question would only be fully answered in a mathematical sense by Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Just to give you an idea of how much of a headache this question gave philosophers and scientists for most of our history. Another question is one that came from Xenophonus. Namely, the difference between knowledge, that is, things you know absolutely sure and that cannot be questioned, and things that you may or may not be sure about, but you only have beliefs or opinions about it. How do you distinguish between those two? How do you know for sure that one fact is something you know and another fact is something you only believe? And finally, Xenophanes also introduced a new opposite. Namely, the opposite between being and not being. But what was not being, actually? Or what was nothing? Can you even really think about nothing? Okay, let's take a few steps back. Let's imagine a single particle of arche, surrounded by nothing. Now let's imagine it moving. Okay, that looks like something. But now let's really focus on the particle itself. 
Yes, you see that? But now a background is still moving. So let's make it absolutely nothing. A single particle surrounded by absolutely nothing. Moving around. It doesn't look like anything to me. Exactly. There is no reference. No way to know if it is even moving. So it might as well not move at all. And as Parmenides was struggling with this question of particles and motion and nothingness, he tried to formulate a way to deal with them. And he wrote this down in a poem. Quite a long poem, and thankfully, much of it survived. In it, he begins by describing something like a journey to heaven, where he is introduced to a goddess. To us this sounds strange, but it probably is just a stylistic figure, and not an actual claim to divine revelation like Moses or Pythagoras. The goddess then explains to him that there are two ways of thinking. Thinking with rigid logic, or having an opinion. And then there are two things to think about. Thinking about what is, and about what is not. Then he is told that you should only think with a rigid logic and only about what is. He should not pay attention to all the different opinions of men, nor should he think about what is not, because it is literally unthinkable. And this is what follows when you think logically about what is, which is the second part of the poem. Whatever is, is. And what is, must be. What is, cannot not exist. And what is not, cannot exist. Did you follow that? Whatever is, is. And whatever is, necessarily exists. And then the opposite, whatever does not exist, cannot exist. And it is necessary that it doesn't exist. As a philosopher, Parmenides must think about what is. Not about what is not, but only about what is. What is cannot be destroyed. Nor can it come into existence, because if something comes into existence, where did it come from? And if it is destroyed, where does it go? Nowhere. This new particle of Arche that just came into being, it came into being from nothing. Truly nothing. How can that generate something? That is impossible. Therefore, what is cannot move, or grow, or shrink, and it cannot change. All of these things are impossible, if you really believe that the Arche is what the Milesians thought it was. This also makes it unthinkable to speak of time. Because the only way we even understand what time is, has to do with how things move and change. So whatever is, has always been, and will always be, never changing, never improving, never deteriorating, but always perfect and complete. But what about everything that I see, and that is moving? What is that? All of that is an illusion. Nothing you see or hear is really what is out there. Those are only opinions, because everyone has different impressions, experiences and observations. None of it is truly real. And the only reason you think that change is real, and that one thing is different from another, is because that is how you are trained to think. But if we just open our eyes and think rationally, we will see that only what is, is. And that what is not, is not and cannot be thought of. And then the third and final part of the poem looks as if it is providing a long and complex cosmology. Reading it carefully, you will find that it is an interesting mixture of what some previous philosophers have proposed, and some new ideas as well. But it is introduced with a warning, that this is merely a description of opinions of men. This theoretical cosmology is not knowledge, because they describe motion and change, and thus cannot be. One of the reasons he describes such an elaborate cosmology may be to remind the reader of the fact that, so far, every philosopher had their own ideas, beliefs and opinions about the cosmos. And they all disagreed. 
Isn't the fact that they all disagreed proof enough that none of them really knew what the truth really was? Yeah, that's like your opinion, man. So to summarize, Parmenides is studying the nature of reality and he is using a rigid logic to drive his point home. No speculations, no mere opinions, but only what can be known for sure counts. This leads to the conclusion that whatever is truly is and what is not cannot exist and cannot be spoken about and cannot be thought. What follows necessarily from this approach is that much of what we believe or assume about reality is not true. Change is not true, motion is impossible, variation cannot exist and time doesn't work. This one extreme position in philosophy can be summed up in the famous phrase whatever is, is. For our next philosopher we will jump ahead in time and look at Parmenides' most famous student, Zeno. Then we will come back to this time and see which philosopher is going to take Parmenides to task with an opposite and equally extreme position. In the meantime, you can subscribe for more and follow me on social media to see what else I'm working on.